What moments of rejection in your teen years do you remember vividly? Getting cut from the team, not be invited to a big party, turned down for a date. All right. Uh, the one I, I came to mind was uh, at the, uh, they used to have a sock hop at the Westwood Country Club, or what they called sock hops back in the days. And uh, they'd have a DJ or something, and the girls would be on one side and the guys would be on another side. And then it's walking across that uh, big gap to uh, ask somebody to dance and then having to walk back. <laughs> somebody to dance oh, the walk of shame. Yeah, yeah the walk of shame. Right? <laughs> took, a lot of, th took a lot of guts to walk on over there, Dwight. Yeah, I know. But it, and the other thing was, is that for some reason they had a kind of dim in there. So. You know, if you, you thought you saw a pretty girl from across the room and as you were getting closer, you're going, oh, no, this is a bad, bad choice. So it was. <laughs> has, has Susan apologized to you for that rejection? <laughs> no, no, she was. So, <laughs> she probably wasn't even born when I was doing that, actually. Uh, so. <laughs> What was your idea of God when you were a child? Remember back that far. I think you like yeah. a lamb, meek and mild. Like the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yeah. Kinda. yeah it's kind of uh, man behind the curtain. Yeah. yeah, it was that picture on the front of those blue hardback Bible books where it's Jesus under a tree with little children around him. And I had that image for a long, long time. Hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that, I remember that picture. I yeah, Bible reader. Yeah. How has your idea of God changed as you have grown up? Still trying to wrap my head around it. Right? Yeah. Mine, mine kind of was, uh, holy smokes, where did that come from? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine was... Uh... They didn't tell all these stories when I was in Sunday school. They didn't tell <laughs> yep. Yep. And I don't remember the bear story. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I think what I'm thinking is, uh, you know, we always talk about uh, God creating the uh, heavens and the earth and everything else, and then it wasn't until it got older that you realized that. Jesus was there at that point in time too. The Son was, and the Holy Spirit. They were all there. So, because you kind of wonder, we and probably initially, if I even picked up on it when it says "let's make man in our image," uh, I may have thought that that, that plural "let us" would would have been the uh, God and the angels. But it uh, wasn't until later in life that I realized all three were present and in heaven and part of the creation process. Okay, no part for Rick here, but so this is your Steve. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godless away from, godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, 
so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. Who, was known the, who, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has, ever, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so anybody else got any questions? Yeah, let's get into it. There's a lot of stuff to unwrap in this one. Yeah, so I was having trouble. I did several different directions. Could have gone and... Uh, it uh, spoke a lot about it. A lot of uh, commentaries talked about, uh, uh, especially 32, where God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. And they, they kind of got into uh, universalism, many paths to God. If he has a separate path for Israel and, and a separate path for Christians. So some people got off on those tangents too um uh, he kind of misquoted up here uh isaiah and i'm not sure whether i um it's a critical misquote or not so there's a lot i, was, I got kind of got uh, off on different tangents and i'm not sure we got into everything so and actually in the niv this actually starts off, he finishes up. This should start with four. I do not want you to be ignorant. So kind of carry over from uh, last week. So yeah, let's get into it. Um, what is the mystery Paul discovered here? Jesus? <laughs> when in doubt? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you automatically get half credit regardless, Steve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's going to tell me I'm wrong with that answer, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that uh, you're not conceited, you Gentiles. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, that is written. So the deliverer will come from Zion, he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So, um, yeah, it's uh, still a mystery to me. So, it's, it's, well, I think is, is he they're referring to the fact that that. Israel's heart was hardened, um, and the the people that they separated themselves from were saved because of it. And the and then they must be standing there. The mystery part is why, after all those promises and the covenant, why I let yeah. this happen? I don't know. That's that's what I think it might be. Yeah, no, I I thought that too, but it's it's kind of uh, the curious part i mean um is he made those promises and, and the last week and we've gone through a lot of this on how well god didn't actually renege on his promises because israel still he's still going to fulfill those at some point so again that it kind of got into the question as well as when's he going to fulfill that does he do it for just when when jesus returns and then this group of uh, the israelites or jews then then accept christ when he returns or i mean that that part was kind of confusing uh, is he is he writing this to other believers like him or to the gentiles alike it's you, gentiles you said, the, go ahead i guess it's a, the roman 
people, which would be both Jews and Gentiles. So. Okay, it's not okay. It's not just written to the Jew, other Jewish believers. Okay, right. You go back to the to the question you asked at the very beginning of, of when we were young, small. What was our vision of God and things? And I would look at something like this and say, "How does He do that?" I mean, yeah. How can He do? And you sort of grow into the reality of it finally. Uh, if if indeed we ever do get totally there, and I'm not sure we do get totally there, but but how does he do that? <laughs> yeah, so it's not. Yeah, it's it's a journey. I mean, uh, that uh, we we get um, as we try to uh, if we accepted Christ and then. Uh, we're working to become what he already sees us as so um with his help but uh, i think one of the i mean the tangent that they, they said uh, more than one a couple of commentators said that uh, people go off on so uh, is um and there's another verse in this passage too that as well if he um hardened everybody's heart so that then uh he can uh, then have mercy on them, then isn't that true of everybody, not just Jews and Gentiles? Well, Gentiles covers a big, big thing, but uh, um, I think I, well, I got some more questions on that. Is the hardening of Israel's heart permanent? And I think back to some of our earlier discussion in, the, in the, these chapters, are all the Israelites' hearts hardened? Is it well permanent? based on the until? No. So it's. Well, it, I think the answer to both questions is no. So if if not permanent, how long does it last? <laughs> until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Okay, I think the next question would be. Do you do you envision that to be when Christ comes again? So that's the thing that kind of uh, that that's, that's part of the question here that I, I struggle with. So yeah. is that when Christ comes again, or uh, does that just apply to the Jews or Israelites that are alive at that time when Christ comes? Is it a one at a time, one person at a time? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, and when we were first going through this, one of the things I was trying to figure out is, is he speaking of an of a current event or is he speaking of forever? So the, in other words, what's the context of this? And it feels to me like it's for all time is what this is targeted to, not today or tomorrow. In other words, there's a prophecy in here. Yeah, there's a process. Is that what you said? Prophecy. Prophecy. Oh. Yeah, I think there's that. That's I think that's part of it too. Uh, yeah, he's he's telling them that this will come, and as we've talked, it's actually just one church, one uh, olive tree. Um, and there's several things, I mean, he talked, we talked uh, a lot in uh, some the earlier lessons about the God's election, and uh, I think that that's some, one of the conclusions we, we reached is that actually everybody is kind of chosen by God, but then we just have to respond to that election, I guess, uh, for it, so everybody has that opportunity But yeah, so that kind of you know, what did that mean? I think when when he's talking about um, all Israel, I guess how did we? How would you define that? And how would you define the full number of Gentiles? So does um, the question is does all Israel mean every individual Jew, or just is, is it more like this is the the nation? will be saved but maybe not every individual will accept the election if you will or 
Um, that's and you know what the full number does that mean every Gentile, or does that mean the the Gentile is as a group, whatever that number is. <laughs> Hundred forty-four thousand. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a joke. That's a joke. No, I, I. Well, to some people, it's not a joke. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, to me, all Israel. You know, you have to go back to who does he define as Israel? You know, would he? Would Paul have? filtered out those that are really not even following the Jewish faith, right? They're, they're Jewish, but they're not following the faith. Or would he just throw everybody in a bucket? Because I think it's the same for the Gentiles. It, the context is exactly the same when he refers to the, the Israel, for Israel and he refers to the Gentiles. It's those that come to Christ. Yeah, no, I think that that's great. Probably more, more of the sense of what I was getting out of it too. It's not talking like all of them, because I uh, know. I mean, um, the Israelites themselves are probably to define it as all that are descendants of uh, Abraham, or actually of Jacob, who became Israel when they changed his name. Um, and Paul went through that whole discussion just because you were born into this family doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to experience all those promises because um, you have to accept them or follow the faith or that type of thing. So, so yeah, so I think that's, that's what it's talking about. Like what you said, Greg. Oh, so this, yeah, that's what I had in the question. So how do you interpret all Israel? So that's, that, and how do you talk about the full number of Gentiles? So that, that was kind of one of the initial questions that I was, uh, was uh, struggling with as I went through this. Um, and I, I kind of look at full number as God knows what that number is. Nobody else knows. How do you quantify it? God knows. Nobody else yeah. knows. Not even Paul, Right. Right. Uh, back to what Greg said, the 144,000. I don't know how many uh, 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 Jehovah's Witnesses uh, I've talked to or come by my door that say they know one of those 144,000. So how many people have been saying that for so long? So anyway. My, my question was always, what if you're number 144,001? Yeah. <laughs> Or if you're 144,000, can you be bumped to 144,001? Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So that was uh, one question. So uh, I didn't finish this question, but so this is the original passage uh, in one translation, Isaiah 59, 20 and 20, I guess 20. The Redeemer will come, come to Zion and to those in Jacob who turn from transgression. This is the Lord's declaration, declaration. Now, Paul takes it and he says, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Hmm. So, why why did Paul make that change? Do you think? And uh, here it's talking about uh, Jacob turning from transgression, and here Paul says he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And Jacob, it was Jacob that was renamed Israel, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess at this point, Paul knows he came from Zion. Right? Yeah. It's post post Christ. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. 
kind of like that scripture was fulfilled. Well, if you come to some place, you will then come from. From, someplace. yeah. All right, yes, yeah, all right, we're, we're doing it. So, yeah, this is, yeah, this is future uh, prophecy, and then, yeah, you're right. So then Paul's saying that this has, in essence, this has been fulfilled. And um, here, Jacob, who turns from transgression and, here when he says uh, he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. So another, I guess uh, being awake might help a little bit. So that's <laughs> you think? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus um, came to Zion. Uh, he was on the cross. So he took godlessness away from us. So now this makes sense. Uh, yeah. So Jesus will come come from Zion, and He's going to take away the sin from Jacob, rather than Jacob being the one that turns from his transgression. Well, of course, I think He would need to do that anyway to accept His election or whatever. All right. Well, thanks. So, I, I was I was just reading the King James version of twenty five and twenty six, and it's interesting. It says. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest the ye should be wise in your own conceits, and blindness in part is happened to the to Israel, which is a different phrasing, right? The yeah. Blindness and harmony, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. So it's the fullness of the Gentiles, whole number of Gentiles. Well, yeah, I think I, I, I thanks for bringing that, that one up. I think I, uh, so I think the difference in the terms blindness and hardened, hardened makes you think of Pharaoh, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. At least for me. Blindness does not. It's kind of a completely different concept. Makes me think of Paul. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, good, good. That's good. Yeah, I think the, the passion has a little different too. It says, uh, my beloved brothers and sisters, I want to share with you a mystery concerning Israel's future. For understanding this mystery will keep you from thinking you already know everything. A partial and temporary hardening to the gospel has come over Israel. Now, see here, this is a lot more that's specific too, and blinding, yeah. and, uh, but this says partial and temporary hard to the gospel, uh, which will last until the full number of non-Jews is coming to God's family. And then God will bring all of Israel to salvation. Oh, so then, and then it goes on to say the prophecy will be fulfilled. So here it said the prophecy will be fulfilled to the uh, coming from Zion will be the savior and he will turn Jacob away from e evil. But this is my covenant promise with them when I forgive their sins. Oh. Huh. what an advantage it is to have 15 20 different versions on your iphone so you can read these and yeah understand better what it means yeah i've got yeah, several here let me see oh except i'll look one other one Well, th yeah, this is from the Phillips translation, which I think, as I just remember, it was a, a New Testament only thing, but it seemed like it was my dad's favorite. So now I don't want you, my brothers, to start imagining things, and I must therefore share with you my knowledge of God's secret secret plan. It is this, that the partial insensibility which has come to Israel 
is only to last until the full number of Gentiles has been called in. Once this has ha happened, all Israel will be saved. As the scripture says, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodlessness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So, okay, yeah. Multiple translations help. That makes it sound like it's the second coming. Yeah, there was, they talked about that a lot in, in the commentaries too. Is this the second coming? So how's that work? Um, so this, the message is a little bit, of course, it's always a little bit different. I want to lay this all out on the table as clearly as I can, friends. This is complicated. It would be easy to misinterpret what's going on and arrogantly assume that you're royalty and they're just, they're just rabble out on their ears for good. But that's not it at all. The hardness on the part of insider Israel toward God is temporary. Its effect is to open things up to all outsiders so that we end up with a full house. Before it's all over, there will be a complete Israel. And again, in that, that the sense that we kind of got from uh, uh, an earlier part of this uh, foray into uh, Israel uh, is that we, we actually complete Israel, or Israel's complete too, when they um, accept Christ. For as it is written, uh, a champion will stride down from the mountain of Zion. He'll clean house in Jacob. Um, interesting it's always looks a little clearer in the morning so thanks to you guys i guess well i think it, what's interesting to me is you know you, you think of paul and why did he write this and how did he construct it and how did he have so so much confidence in it and it's, it all comes back to paul unshakably believed the covenants of God. And he also knew them very well. I mean, he's from a scholarly perspective. And so right. he was putting the, that perspective of, of history and the perspective of what was happening around him together. And he said, look, God said, this is what's going to be, and it's going to be. And here's what it means. I think that's really interesting. You know, it, it it took a guy like Paul and his background in history to be able to assemble this to make it clear for the both the Gentiles and the and the Jews in Rome of what was happening and what was going to happen. I, I wonder if I have that much confidence sometimes. Yeah, I mean, well, that's that's. Uh having Paul's background as he talks about things that are happening post-Christ resurrection uh, on, on the history. Of course, he can speak from being such a Jew, a Pharisee, all those things. So as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. So in what sense are the Jews enemies on the Gentiles' account? Well, they're not rooting for the Gentiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So they're not rooting for the Gentiles. In fact, they don't even want them to uh, associate. Uh, they don't want to think that they're going to be part of the same group, the same olive tree, the same church. But, so there was some, and I can't remember exactly where, where the, the commentary was inserting it, but... Uh, um, when when uh, the Christians, oh, there's another sense, and I don't, I forget whether I have questions on this or just whether 
they were talking about it in the commentary, but at what point I can't remember now, but they talked about there was a lot of uh, uh, early Christians, I mean, like in uh, the early 1900s or or something that uh, thinking that the, the Christ, Christians uh, replaced Israel as God's chosen people. And um, that was up until the, the Second World War. And when they the Holocaust happened, this was one of the narratives uh, that uh, they're going, well, wait, this anti-Semitism, I think I got a question on that somewhere, um, is really not, I don't think that's what God's talking about. So uh, we're all supposed to be, so some people started realizing um, I think Schofield was, uh, uh, there's a Schofield Bible uh, translation, uh, but he was one of the ones that was uh, talked quite a bit about, uh, according to the commentary I was reading, about the uh, the Jews, I mean, the Christians replacing the Jews. But I think there was a, a number of Protestants, I guess, that uh, after the Holocaust and they're going, well, they started rethinking that, but, you know, maybe that's not right because that, that kind of Hitler kind of uh, jumped on that quite a bit when he wanted to set up the master race. So, um, so there's part of that going on that on some of the commentary I was reading. So I was trying to pull that all together a little bit. Um, it, to me, I keep coming back to this analogy of grafting, you know, to the olive tree and, um, by grafting different vines to it, it makes it stronger. But in, this is God grafting. This is not a you know arborist making right. some adjustments. This is it makes me think of the duck built platypus. So here's God. He's creating all these animals. He's made some really good parts. And he's going. I think I'm going to take that one from that flying thing over there, and I'm going to put it on this thing that, that swims in the water, and I'm going to give him those duck feet and, you know, and, but it's God making it right. It's not us in some laboratory throwing something together um, to make a, make it better. And, yeah. Was, well, on that, I'll just interject and, and not to distract everybody, but I always thought the duck bill platypus was that uh, God was making all these different animals and they kind of finished, but the angels go, and we got these parts left over here. <laughs> what can you make with that? So, yeah. uh, sorry. But. No, I, I look at it like he had these parts, but he'd already used them. They were, and he goes, those are really good parts. And for, for this animal, this is what I want. I want to, I'm going to reuse these parts and I'll put this thing together. And that's yeah. going to be, man, it's going to be great. It's a little bit like the Edsel. <laughs> uh, and all things are expensive now if you happen to have one you've got a oh yeah a treasure so sorry for that no that's all right and i d even distracted you further with uh on that story but that that's a good analogy though why is it significant that significant that as far as election is concerned they the jews are loved on account of the patriarchs i mean is that a reference to the fact that that's really who the covenant was given to i struggle with this one a little bit yeah well no well no it goes on in verse 29 so for God's gifts and his yep. call are irrevocable. So maybe it seems to, re to me, it seemed to refer back to the promises to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. I agree with that. So. What did Paul say about God's promises. Oh, I, we just talked about that. So irrevocable. Right. Thanks. And it wasn't even underlined. What uh what do you see? Um similarities do you see between the Gentile path to mercy versus 
30 and the Israelite path to mercy, verse 31. So just as you who are at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. My first thought is the way Paul writes drives me crazy, but yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Do we have do we have to be disobedient in order to receive mercy? Yeah, and that's many people got off on that tangent. Mm -hmm. So, saying aren't all people's uh, disobedient? Do you know what mercy is if you haven't been disobedient? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So for God is it's interesting that he's talking about mercy and not grace. What what would you think is the difference? Well, I'm trying to think. So I think what I've always been told is is justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve and grace is getting what you don't deserve so there's a difference between mercy and grace right so i'm just just paul being all about grace it's interesting it reflects back to mercy and i don't know if that's because of a he's kind of looking at it from the old testament perspective in this i don't know yeah well can you uh So can you have grace without first receiving mercy? No, that I'm, so you, you can pay the piper, but still have grace. You can what? You can pay the piper, but still receive grace. In other words, the third thief, he was he was going down, right? He, he, had, he had done his deed, he was condemned, and he was going to die. There is no mercy in life there, but he receives grace in that he was welcomed into heaven. Grace is no strings attached. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Has anybody ever heard the difference between common grace and giving grace? Oh, what two graces? Two graces. One's common, common grace, and the other is giving grace. Why well, well, silence? We would say no. <laughs> Or giving grace, is that what you say before you eat? Giving grace is what God did when he gave his only son to die for us. Common grace is all the natural things. We take it for uh, granted. His creation, air, blue sky, water. Oh, okay. Oh, I got quiet. <laughs> no, I would think we're thinking That's about good. it. So. Yeah, I got to think about that. Well, I, I read that. Uh, I would like to think that's my own idea of grace, but mm. uh, God gave us his, the creation. Many of us, in fact, I just talked to this about a bunch, uh, thing I did yesterday with the guys at the Open Door Mission, is that we take for granted a, a tremendous amount of grace God's given us, which is common grace. And that's the, his creation himself. And we are all part of God's creation also. So, uh, you know, it's, that's the mercy that he's showing through grace to us in common. But then from our sinful side, he gave his only son. And that's giving grace. Oh, that's certainly a new spin. <laughs> So, well, you hear people say giving grace, and then you hear people talk about common grace. And I never, that's the reason I looked it up. 
because I heard that I really didn't know the definition of what the two really meant to me. So, but that's what I found. Okay. So verse 32 is the one that's caused um, a lot of um, problem um, and misinterpretation. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. So this is, uh, yeah, this is it. So I love to commit sins and God loves to forgive them. Isn't the world admirably arranged? Yeah. Or as Rob Bell would say, is this an Ali Ali in free? I just look at that as this is like free will, right? Right? All men are disobedient because of free will. Right. And it, do it doesn't say he will have mercy on them all. He may have mercy on them all. There's a big difference there. All right. Let me check and see what something else says. <clears throat> In one way or another, God makes sure that we all experience what it means to be outside so that he can personally open the door and welcome us back in. That was the message translation. So that he can, right? <clears throat> so that he can. Yeah. That will. Yeah. Well, and King James is uh, that he might have mercy on yeah. him. There you go. <laughs> and let's see. There's still an acceptance that needs to be made there. Yeah, I think the might is a much stronger word. Yeah. Oh, so actually, God considers all of humanity to be prisoners of their unbelief so that he can unlock our hearts and show his tender mercies to all who come to, to, all who come to him. Yeah. So well, I, could, I mean, I could see, I can see people taking this and thinking, holly, holly, ocean free, right? Yeah, God's merciful and loving, and we're created in His image. And I, yeah, I can, I can see people taking it that way. So they had a lot of discussion on that, and uh, but yeah, and the passion I think gets part of it too. So it's uh, to show His tender mercies to all who come to Him. It's just not. For, and, and they go out and ignore God, I guess. Uh, but to, to get that, you have to uh, come to him. Do That's we that. have people saying, wait a minute, why do I need this? What have I done wrong? There probably are some like that. Well, yeah, they, come, they say they're out here doing their free will disobedience and they don't even realize that they need um, mm -hmm. mercy. Or do they think it is disobedience? They may think it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Why do I need mercy? What, what, you know, hmm. and then, it, then it gets back into uh, the question that, that some will say, and it's either what the God's writing his uh, moral code or, or something on your heart, and, and that uh, a person can um, really know what's what's moral, what's not moral. You know, know it's um, with, without, and we've talked about this some, and and I think it was some in Romans, and a lot of what what Paul says is that. Uh, you know, with, without even knowing the Ten Commandments, or you, you have some awareness of what is right and wrong. Until you, if you harden yourself and are, continue to uh, uh, go against what you know is, is wrong in your heart, uh, you, I, I can't uh, imagine that even a non-Christian or non-believer, non-Jew, or anyway, would not know that it's you shouldn't be killing other people you shouldn't be stealing um so 
there's some of that 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 Paul's talked about in the past. Where our culture is today, I'm not so sure people really understand this absolute truth. I think it's that gap is widening uh, such that I would agree with you why that used to be the case. Well, this is right and that's wrong. I'm not so sure that the people um, have gospel that. according to John, chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word. Sorry, I. Oh, I hear that Bible. That is God talking to us. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Where's that, where's that voice coming from? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think this is it. I had. I, there was discussion and some of the commentary about anti-Semitism and some have by misrepresenting considered universalism. Uh, if the Jews have one path and the Christians another, who is to say there are not other paths? So some take this. I, I think what, what um, I don't know whether I have another question on that, but I think what uh, this kind of led to, so, in the discussion about, well, the Jews had one path and uh, Christians have another path. And so why can't the, the Muslim path be good too and the Buddhist path be good too? Uh, so they kind of got off in some of that discussion too. So, but I think what Paul's trying to do then is get, get the Jews and the Israelites to understand there's just one path. And they're all part of the same family, same church, the same olive tree. So, yeah, I don't think the word was plural. It was one path. Right. So the interesting thing about the olive tree analogy going back is there were branches that were broken off. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's not saying they can't be grafted back in, but they were clearly broken off at some point. <laughs> and new ones were grafted in. So I, that again. I think it's a great analogy. Especially when you're talking about Jews and Christians, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, I know, I thought we weren't going to get too far in this but this is good so uh, looking at the start of chapters nine one through five what effect does uh, paul's knowledge of god's sovereign election of his people have on him so uh they suggested i read through this it was at uh, chapter nine i speak the truth in christ i am not lying my conscience confirmed it in the holy spirit I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. There's the adoption of son. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever <laughs> praised. Amen. And so he ends this discussion of these last uh, of these three chapters on um, about Israel, and he says, "Oh, the depths of the riches of wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable His judgments and His past beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay Him?" For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So, as we go through this part here on the Israel, what, what, what effect does the knowledge of God's sovereign election of Israel have on Paul? Or why does he insert these three chapters on Israel into this book on Romans? Okay, I'm moving on. Yeah. 
So why would Paul say that glory should be given to God forever in verse 36? For from him and through him and to mm -hmm. all him are all things to him. That's why you should be given glory forever. So it kind of answers that in the uh, in the verse itself, I think. Unless somebody else thinks differently. So in verses 33 through 36, uh, how how does Paul describe God? All knowledgeable, sovereign, yeah. creator of all things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Unreproachable. God is good. Yes. Okay, let me uh, move to these. You can look at these later. And again, there's so many topics in this, so I'll just pull a few points from some of the commentary. All Israel is not best understood numerically any more than the Gentiles should be taken to mean every individual Gentile. The implication is not that as the Perus per Perusia or that's the return of Christ, all Jews alive at that time will be saved. The best understanding is that offered by F.F. Bruce. All Israel is a recurring expression in Jewish literature, where it need not mean every Jew without single exception, but Israel as a whole. Paul's point here is that in the future, when the elect of the Gentiles have been saved, the hardening currently afflicting Israel will be removed and all Israel will resume its position as the elect of people of God before him. At that point, salvation of individuals will occur as it did for Paul and always has on the basis of personal faith in Israel's Savior, Savior and Messiah, Jesus Christ. So I thought that kind of maybe covered that one part a little bit. Paul concludes this eschatological survey of the future of Israel and Gentiles as they relate to Israel by revealing what is behind the plan of God for both. God has banned all men over to disobedience so that they may, he may have mercy on them. This universalist sounding summary is not what the cynic might propose, that after all this, God is going to have mercy on and save everyone. Rather, Paul is saying that both categories of humanity Jews and Gentiles will one day find themselves in the favor of God solely on the basis of his mercy. While it might have been said before Israel's hardening that it was only the Gentiles who have shown mercy, mercy, now Israel has become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy. The moment Israel, at the moment, Israel is the enemy of the gospel. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. God's promises made to Abraham and his descendants still stand today, since God's gift and his call are irrevocable. While there is only one people of God, the spiritual faithful from both the Jews and the Gentiles, the nation of Israel still stands as a God-preserved testimony to all earth of his faithfulness to his promises. One day when the glory of the Lord covers the earth, it will be because the mercy of God is being praised by both Jew and Gentile alike. The Jews received mercy in the calling of Abraham because of the Gentiles' disobedience, and the Gentiles received mercy because of the Jews' disobedience. We do not fully understand election. We do not fully understand hardening. We do not fully understand God closing the eyes and ears of people who need his truth people whom he wants to receive it. We do not fully understand his timetable. We do not fully understand, though we try because we want to, the eternal destinies of those who live and die in the period of Israel's hardening. We do not fully understand what makes those who live at a time when Israel's disobedience is removed more deserving of mercy, to speak in human terms, that those who did not receive mercy and least of all, we do not understand why those who write about Romans and teach others about Romans have received mercy, knowing ourselves as we do. Paul was right. The riches of wisdom and knowledge of God are too deep for us. And I go, no kidding. So, 
Any other thoughts or comments on uh, that passage? Okay, so. Question is, what do the Jews think about the New Testament? Is it just another book or is it fiction or? Yeah, yeah, they no, that they, yeah, that I don't know what they they think about it. I know other than they don't believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of yeah, a story about a great man, you know, a prophet. Yeah. That, that's about it. Not the savior for them. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they, they they kind of. <laughs> They put Jesus in the same category as they put Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> but there, like I said, there are there are some. I mean, like uh, Jonathan Khan is is a uh, is a rabbi and uh, Jews for Jesus. Yeah, but he fought, he uh, he became a messianic Jew, and uh, so um, I, I sent out earlier that uh, you know I think Dave Marshall's coming back. They were out Cape Cod, um, but he has pancreatic cancer, so he was was in our group for for years until he retired. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be great if he came back and joined it. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think I'll, well, I think I, uh, Joe Travis sent me his email. I, so it certainly will invite him. Um, any other, uh, any updates or any things we need to add? And, Okay, well, let's um, spend a moment in prayer. And uh, here we go. Dear Father, uh, th uh, thank you for uh, th these men and our time in the Word today. And um, uh, thank you for the clarity that uh, I get uh, as we s study your Word with these guys. And uh, although it's a, we just read from the commentary, we did not un understand everything, but uh, I can say it's it's becoming a little clearer when we go through these things. And again, um, as we repeat and repeat, uh, coming back and finally we get a little bit more each time. So thankful and grateful for that. Thank you, God. 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 Heavenly Father, we just ask you to continue to be with us, those on our list that uh, need your healing touch. So now would be a good time, Father. Um, and we just uh, ask that we continue to feel your, your presence, your protection on our family, our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. Um, Father, we, we don't know. Uh, we know you want the best for your people. We ask that you continue to watch over us, keep us safe in Goshen. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah, so uh, sent out some uh, things. I don't know why they read that email yet, but it, I kind of uh, so abbreviated from what I really wanted.